Alrighty, it's one. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is Common Sense Career Transitions, and I'm Celeste Thayer. Uh, you're welcome to interrupt me at any point in time. And also, I have a neurological condition that is new to me, so I am not able to pronounce in the same way that I used to. Um, if I am mispronouncing something, feel free to let me know, or like if you can't understand, I can repeat myself. It's not going to offend me. Um, I also have to give you the standard disclaimer. I do not represent the opinions of my employer in any way. All opinions and findings are my own. But I want to know why you guys are here. I asked a couple of people a few minutes earlier. Um, but some people might be going through or considering a job or career transition. Does anyone feel that way? I see some hands raised, some head nods. Cool. Then, good. I think this will be useful for all of you. Um, by the end of this, I hope that you have more tools in your toolbox in order to get a job, I mean, obviously, uh, but also like the intangibles that come with that. Feed yourself, buy a home, even find new friends, maybe. Um, I'm a big fan of improving oneself in general. Uh, you'll also learn a little bit about learning and trying new things. And you might be a more interesting person at the end of this. I mean, if not, oh well. <laughs> <coughs> So this is what we're going to go through today. We're going to talk about my own personal path. Um, we're going to learn a key skill about using 20 seconds of courage. We're going to go through my personal decision-making framework, and it might not be yours. That's fine. We're going to go through at least one real-world example, then talk about resumes and job descriptions. Uh, we're going to talk about some things that I learned and how I started iterating upon the framework that I was using to make these decisions. Uh, one more real, real world example. Uh, we'll also talk about developing and using your network. Then I'll talk about how I found the latest role that I'm in today. And finally, we'll end on one of my favorite things, which is learning how to learn. So cool, this is my path. I worked in restaurants for a really long time until I got doing really big restaurants and many of them, and I got bored. Uh, I had been doing school in parallel, but couldn't make up my mind, didn't know what field I wanted to be in. I ended up in civil engineering, sort of randomly. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree, but it was the recession. So I went back and I got a master's degree, but by that time the recession was worse. Um, I went on and started writing at Amazon. I wrote about industrial and scientific supplies, which is really thrilling when you're talking about different flavors of steel over and over and over. So I didn't last long. Um, I started doing database operations because that was more interesting dealing with the catalog. Um, then I did some security stuff, then I did some cloud migration stuff, and now I manage a dev team in early server provisioning. So 20 seconds of courage. I'll give you a moment to read this quote. So this tool is a pretty simple one. <clears throat> 20 seconds of courage, like wh what is that, right? Um, this tool is intended to address that feeling. I don't know if you felt it before. You kind of want to do something, but it's a little scary, right? Uh, maybe some new experience, skydiving, who knows? Um, raise your hand if you felt like that. I want to do it, but I'm too scared. <laughs> totally. Um, that's, uh, so how you deal with that? Personally, I actually take a second and I'm like, Oh shit, I'm scared. <laughs> okay, that's neat. Let's move on. Um, so I put on my pretend like dragon slaying helmet and take my sword um, and I do whatever it is anyways. But I break it down into really small pieces. So like, I want to go skydiving. I'll go to a website, use my 20 seconds of courage, sign up for a skydiving company's mailing list. Sweet. So that was cool, nobody died, right? And then next week they email me, they're like, hey, buy my skydiving thing. I'm like, okay, got my sword, okay. Like that wasn't so hard, nobody died again, cool. Um, and then, you know, it comes time to actually go. It's like, okay, well, I use my 20 seconds of courage and I call a lift, and then I get in the lift, and then I go. So like, in the end, I use maybe like, what, a minute of courage spread out over several weeks, but like I enabled myself to sort of trick myself into doing something that was scary. Um, I tried to find the source for this quote, so I left some stuff at the bottom. I couldn't figure out where it started. 
All right, so the framework that I use. It's a pretty big question and you're probably going to find different answers or even a different framework than I did. That's fine. I'll just talk about what I know. Um, a lot of people do like pros and cons lists. I kind of hate them. Like when you write down pros and cons, it's really easy to just look and say, hey, there's a lot more on the pro side. I should do that, right? But I, I've tried that and it hasn't worked out well for me. So instead, I actually go with sort of more of a gut feeling. I sit there and I ask myself a lot of challenging questions. The first one is always, should I stay or should I go? And at this point in time in my life, I know if I'm asking myself that, it's time to leave. Like, <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> um, and so then I talk through some details, like whether or not I actually enjoy the work. Like, I've been in places where I loved the work and I hated the people I worked with. Also a sign to leave. Um, what skills am I using well? If I get a lot of feedback from people that they're like, hey, Celeste, I really like how you wrote that document. I'm like, cool, maybe that means I'm a good doc writer. Like, I didn't think I was that great, but I've heard from five people now. Okay, maybe I'm okay. <laughs> then I ask myself what skills I might need for my next step. This requires a little bit of clarity that can be hard to get. You need to know what the next step is. So throughout this question, like, question and asking myself process, I usually figure out, like, Cool, should I stay a project manager? Cool, should I become a people manager? Whatever. Um, there's always the intangibles as well. Like, I loved civil engineering a lot, but it required you to get up before dawn. And it turns out that's hard for me. Um, so that one was kind of a no-go anyway. Uh, location, like, cool, you might be happy to move around a lot, uh, but some people aren't and if you're gonna look at a job that sales in Asia but your home base is in Seattle you're gonna be traveling a lot like maybe that's not the right one for you I mentioned this a little bit earlier but your peers are important too I mean, people talk about work-life balance and I always think that's so funny it's like I don't go to work stop my heartbeat do stuff for eight hours and then leave. Like, I'm still alive at work. I should like it and I should like the people that I'm there with. Or at least tolerate them. And then if there's something that you're like, cool, I really want to do this, but I don't know Linux or whatever, um, figure that out and then like do something about it. We'll talk more about that later. And so by the end of asking myself all of these questions, I usually have a pretty good idea of where I'd like to go. So the first example, we talked about this a little bit when I laid out my career path, but I had started looking for a job in civil engineering in 2008. I was a senior. It's usually pretty easy to get a job. I got a lot of like promising bites, but none of them worked out. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's, still didn't have a job, spent a month or so going, oh shit. <laughs> um, still didn't get a job needed to keep an apartment. So I got my master's degree because they paid me to do it. <laughs> um, but when I graduated with a master's, uh, it was 2010 and in Seattle, the recession was worse. There were no cranes. It's not like it is today. Um, so I was like getting hungry, maybe not about to pay rent. Uh, I was like, I just need anything. Who's hiring right now? It turned out Amazon was hiring. Um, I actually interviewed twice, got two jobs, chose the copywriter one. Um, I did that because it had less phone time than the other option, and I don't like talking on the phone. Like, I was not using my own framework here. It's, you can tell. It's super scattered. I had no idea what I wanted. Um, but I did have a pretty good resume, and I think that's actually what got me in the door with Amazon twice, with two job offers from Amazon. I hate resumes, I think they suck. I uh, help friends to develop their resumes so that maybe they get their foot in the door at the same company I'm at. Uh, it's like a mystery. I don't know what makes a resume that appealing, but it does have to at least have some stuff on it. Um, I noticed a lot of headlines lately about how women are only applying for jobs that they are 100% qualified for. I'll get to you in just one second. Um, and I think that's bullshit. You just apply to a job if it sounds good to you. Maybe you get in, maybe you don't. Go ahead. I really hate that about both applying and the job descriptions. What I would love a company to do is to put out, this is what we need at a minimum. Just totally. Exactly what they're actually filtering for. 
I've seen in a couple of places now, they're starting to do like basic qualifications. And then I think Amazon calls the next step preferred, but you see them various things in various places. But it's like, look, if you can, you know, do these three things, cool. If you have these other seven things, great. But even the ones that my peers write at Amazon are crap because they're like, it would be great if you had a PhD. I'm sure it would be great if we all had PhDs. Like, hands? Um, but is the, that relevant to the job? I know, right? Usually it's not. Or uh, a lot of times also at Amazon, you'll see MBA preferred, but for like a developer job. And you're just like, how many software developers go out and get MBAs? Like, that, that many? Um, but hey, maybe it'll get you hired. Uh, really expensive way to do it, though. Um, so a lot of times I just recommend that you use your networks, especially at smaller companies. If you know people, you practically have a foot in the door anyway. Um, at large companies like Amazon, if you know me personally, I'm a little bit more likely to go to the recruiter and say, hey, you haven't called them back. What the fuck? Um, <laughs> we'll talk more about how to generate your network. This is just a couple of ideas. Um, I have a slide where we go into more later. I just think the process sucks, though. You know, like even when I've applied for other large tech companies while at Amazon, it sucks for me then, too. Um, so in order to get my next job at Amazon, I tried to iterate on the framework. This is after I was a writer for a while and I was like, ooh, writing is really boring. And so then I went to do database operations, but they weren't paying me as if I were a technical person. They were paying me as if I was still writing product descriptions and this was kind of a problem. So I'm like, okay. I started asking myself, is it worth it? It's like a lot of stress for not very much money. And then I realized, oh, well, if I'm asking, then yeah, no, it's, it's still time to leave. Um, I use pretty much the same details. Uh, I had realized though that I liked recognition. I like talking to people and having them say, Celeste, thanks. It was really nice talking to you. And so there's a certain like, type of person that is brave enough to ask for help. And it has nothing to do with whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert, although we talk about that more. There are people who will come to you and they'll be like, I would love your help, but they're like texting you. I'm happy to do that too. I still like the recognition. So I was really looking for a team that would appreciate me. Um, same thing though, like if I didn't have the base skills to do the job, I would have been in trouble. Um, and I really worked my network. So I was also sort of torqued about like not being in tech officially, like not having the title. I personally know that I'm also a little bit of like a badge collector like those Xbox Live things or the achievements in World of Warcraft. Oh my God. Um, so almost as much as I was motivated by money, but I did want to buy a house at this time. So I kind of needed the money too. Uh, I talked to over 20 different hiring managers at different uh, teams within Amazon and I took them out to coffee every time. Spent a lot of money on coffee. Um, but if they said, hey Celeste, I don't have room for you right now. I don't need a TPM. I'd be like, cool, do you know anyone who's looking for a TPM? And a lot of times I got redirects. And I used my 20 seconds of courage to do that because it can be a little bit vulnerable to say, hey, you don't want me, but do you know anyone who does? Um, but I think it paid off. Ironically, I went with the very first person that I talked to out of those 20, um, but that's because he was just gonna give me the cool title and again, badge collector. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I moved into, into secure storage as a TPM. I did that for about a year and then started to do policy work across the entire org. Um, I did get some recognition that I wanted and I had some couple really good years, but I still realized that there were some things that were not that great. Um, I did, oh yeah, go ahead. TPM. Oh, sorry, technical program manager or oh. project manager. Uh, Amazon has a weird split between TPMs and PMs, and basically one drives the schedule and one actually knows what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if anyone's a PM at Amazon in this room. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also had plenty of good supportive coworkers and peers, but I didn't have a lot of them, and that was sort of important for me. Um, also, after spending some time in security, we talked about this a little bit, I think, um, where I didn't cause any outages, that was great. No one broke in and stole any data, that was great. But you can't really prove a negative. So I knew I was successful, but maybe not the important decision makers. So I realized that I was dissatisfied, 
by this time I knew my own framework really well and I just sort of rolled with it. Um, I knew that I liked being in internal services. I really love talking to customers who actually understand what I'm talking about and who I can sort of use that shortcut, the jargon or language that you use within an organization, even one as large as Amazon. And I didn't really want to go through that process where you always have to bring someone up to speed or you go to a customer site and you have to learn all of their weird details quickly and then nah, I just knew that wasn't for me. Uh, if that's what you like, cool, more power to you. Um, so, we're going to talk about the framework and networking has always been at the bottom, but I really want to like focus on networking. Networking can be done by introverts too. Um, does everyone know what introversion is versus extroversion or have some idea? Cool. Um, there are actually good resources online for developing your network for both. I just recommend Googling it. Um, but I do have a couple of ideas on here. If you are an introvert, you might consider doing something with open source or creating your own educational videos. You can even get paid for that these days, it's great. Um, or you can go to small group meetups. There are some that are very, very large and there are some that are two people in a coffee shop. Find that other one. Um, if you're an extrovert, you can get some recognition and start developing your network by coming and presenting at conferences or going to some of those larger meetups or affinity groups at work, whatever. Um, there are some people that are called ambiverts and I actually consider myself one of those. There are some contexts where I love talking to a lot of people. And there are other contexts like house parties where I fall apart. <laughs> so um, just sort of pick what works for you. That might mean experimenting. I totally like it when people run experiments on themselves. Can you clarify this? Did you say make educational videos or watch educational videos? You can actually make them now and people will pay you. Um, there's one that has a name. It sounds like Cora, and I'm terrible with names, but it's not Cora. But it also starts with a Q. And um, I've looked at their like speaker training videos and they're pretty straightforward. But if you have something you're an expert at, make like a small 30 minute course and you know, maybe you'll get royalties or however they do that. Isn't there something like, oh dang it, I spoke up and I should have said it. Oh, I was like, did you remember the name? <laughs> or of any of There's them? something like Udemy. Mm. Udemy. Yeah, there's Udemy. That's one. Yeah, that does something similar to that. That's a mind field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about that. Maybe I'll ask you after. Oh, they're just stealing it? There's a fair amount of yeah. people stealing content and selling it on Udemy. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. Like, they'll scrape it off of YouTube and then put it on there, and it's really annoying because, like, he's a consultant charging $125 an hour, but his lesson, various lessons he gives out for free to get people to pay for him are mm -hmm. dumped on the website. Oh, so yeah, this is, like, some... It's official is to sign up and pay for Udemy to, like, flag it, hey, this is a copyright infringement. Oh wait, they won't let you just be like, he stole this? You have to, you have to course the content it. and prove that it's uh, a copyright That's so dumb. Okay, maybe not Udemy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, even for people who are doing the introverted way, or the extroverted if you're comfortable with extroversion, um, it can be scary to use your network at all. Um, besides the whole 20 seconds of courage thing, that can be great when you're emailing someone and inviting them out for coffee. Uh, I also use a technique that I call putting the Band-Aid on first. Um, I'm sorry? Put the Band-Aid on first. So uh, you can say something like, hey, it would be really great if you loaned me $50,000. Totally OK if you say no. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe I wouldn't recommend using it with that one. But uh, <laughs> but you get the point. You're like, hey, it's totally OK if you say no, but I'd really like to take you out to coffee and pick your brain on x, right? Um, and that way, it's a little bit easier. You've already given someone an out. It's a little bit less scary than just being like, I want to take you out to coffee. And someone's like, well, that's weird. No thanks, <laughs> right? Um, so giving someone an out makes it easier to ask as the asker. Uh, I actually took someone out for coffee one time uh, and asked her if uh, she was a principal TPM at Amazon. Uh, and I was like, hey, I kind of want to get into technical program management. I think I'm already doing a technical job, but I'm not getting recognized for it. She's, uh, I'm like, can I, can I ask you about the details of the job? She's like, great. And then at the end of that meeting, after she sort of given me the download, I was like, do you think I could be a TPM? 
Ironically, she said no, <laughs> and I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> she, she actually recommended patience and maybe a second degree. Um, but, you know, that was a risk. Uh, it turned out to pay off. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, after the security thing that we have talked about where I was like, maybe I'm not as successful as I wanted to be, I needed to go somewhere else and I found my current role. Um, I work for fleet management at AWS. We help turn on data centers. We don't do the building, we just do the like powering up and provisioning and stuff. Um, I use the same framework, but this time I only asked for different hiring managers. Uh, again, somehow I ended up going with the very first one I talked to. They say never buy the first house you see, but I guess I keep buying the first house, who knows. Um, I did talk to people in roles that I had fulfilled in the past that I thought, well, at least I know I can do these. I think maybe I was falling back on the 100% qualified thing. Um, and uh, I was like, yeah, no, I don't want to be a writer anymore. I really do like tech. So sometimes you can do these experiments on yourself where you're like, could I, could I see myself there talking to this guy for an hour? No. Okay. So that's clarity though, right? Like that's useful information for your decision-making process. Um, I also considered smaller TPM roles, uh, but I realized supporting one Redshift instance was probably not enough excitement for me. Uh, I also asked several people if they would just hire me as an SDM, and they said no. But I mean, at least I asked. Uh, yeah. What is an SDM, please? Oh, sorry, Software Development Manager. Uh, so basically, instead of managing projects, you manage people, slightly busier. Uh, I think it's more rewarding, but yeah. So I ended up playing, placing, placing, putting myself in a place where I knew the leadership. I knew there were people that I respected, they were super nice, they were supportive, and they helped their employees grow into new roles. I clearly wanted to grow into a new role. So it seemed like a pretty good place to be. Um, and within 18 months, I had the thing that I wanted, which was being a software dev manager. Um, I feel like this time I was actually pretty decisive, but I also purposely picked a place where I knew I would be successful. And for a different personality type or someone who wanted different things, maybe they were comfortable in the role they were in, wouldn't have been the right spot for them. Um, cool, so learning how to learn. I feel like this is sort of an important meta point and it's why I throw it in. Uh, huh? Isn't that the site? Coursera? Yeah, totally. Um, so Coursera is a site where you can pay to get a certificate or you can audit a course for free. Uh, there is the course Learning How to Learn on Coursera. Um, I'm not going to cover these concepts in depth here, but if you have a way to memorize information in your back pocket quickly, cool, that probably helps you when you're trying a new job. Or if you have some tricks for you know your own performance, like maybe you know, one of the things they talk about is the Pomodoro method, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. If you have these things that you know make you more productive, able to learn skills or processes faster, able to meet and comfortably talk to new people, or just, you know, have more information in your back pocket for when you need it, super helpful, right? So I recommend maybe spending some time, I know you're all busy people, and if you're in school at Bellevue Technical College, <laughs> telling you to study more is probably not like the first thing that you wanna do. Um, but uh, it will help you be faster at everything in the end. So cool, I've talked really fast today because I'm nervous. Um, but <laughs> what we covered was my path and then some skills. One of those skills was using 20 seconds of courage. Uh, we also talked about my own personal decision make making framework and some real world examples of that. We also talked about some skills, uh, creating resumes and applying to jobs. Uh, then uh, of course we talked about my framework and real world examples again. Last skills we talked about were developing your network and learning how to learn. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to stay and talk to them at the end. You're also welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn or visit me at my website. Thanks everybody. Sounds like you spent a lot of time at Amazon. But like I'm, 
Uh, I'm almost 40. I've worked in IT for, I got my first internship in like 1997, so I've been, you know, I've been a while. Um, mm -hmm. I used to consider myself a bit of a job hopper when I was younger. I've worked for probably 30 different companies. Now some of those are full-time, part-time overlaps and, and things like that, but you know, I actually leave some jobs off of my resume even though they might be um, applicable career-wise. Like for instance, I was the IT administrator for the domestic violence shelter here in town. So mm -hmm. It was a three month long part-time position and so I just leave it off of my resume. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing, so I just started a new full-time job two months ago. One of the things that I worry about is again, when you look at my resume, I, it, and it's not quite as big of a deal now, I say I probably average two to three years at a full-time position. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at least I work in a field where that's maybe not, uh, wouldn't raise as many eyes as more conservative industries. Um, but my concern is that I, I do find myself sometimes wondering if I look for a new company when I'm feeling burned out with a job mm -hmm. versus looking for a new position within the same company. And I think part of the problem maybe is that I tend to work for smaller organizations. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say on average, the, most of the companies I work for are under 200 employees, so very far from like, an, I, I try to work for more like Series B and Series C startups, for instance, is what I look for when I look for a new job. And so, um, it, is, there, is there anything that you could recommend as far as like, you know, you talk about, you talk about um, like is it time to move? How do you differentiate between like, it really is time for you to find a new job versus just like temporary burnout? I guess this, I, totally. sorry for the ramble, but that was like the, the crux of my question is like, how do you differentiate between like, oh my gosh, like what I'm doing right now is just really burning me out and I need to maybe take a break from it or like find a new position in the same company versus like, man, I hate this company and I hate what I'm doing and I just need a completely new seat. I mean, I would recommend that you don't get to that point where you feel burnt out because that's already an emergency, right? Sure. I say that having done exactly that a couple times now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I totally get it, but uh, avoiding burnout is sort of key in the first place, but if you're already there, I totally get it. I would want to leave that company too. Um, I uh, just started sneaking out of work the first time I was burnt out because I was up until 3 a.m. most nights and I was actually chatting with coworkers at that time and I'm like, this is not sustainable or good. And so I dealt with it by just going to yoga for two hours in the middle of the day but because it was in the middle of the day, nobody saw me leave, and it was fine. <laughs> but like, I probably wasn't helping myself out because number one, I was super tired, and number two, just leaving the office to go take a deep breath and maybe like move your body, like while that's healthy, is probably not long-term sustainable, right? Um, so I, I kind of rambled too, honestly. But I recommend figuring that out earlier next time, maybe, and then you know your own warning signs. You're like, cool, if you're like in the bathroom crying, like that's probably too late. Uh, if you're having like stress-related health problems, again, you've gone too far, like catch it earlier, and then maybe do, start asking yourself those questions, similar questions, making your pro-con list, whatever the hell works for you, and start figuring out when you can like switch, right? I work from home, so I do all my crying at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> There's some horrible like gallows jokes about that, because uh, of course there was a desk crier who wrote a book about Amazon and how horrible it was, so we all joke about crying at our desks. <laughs> so, go ahead. I am uh, 61 years old, and uh, I have delusions of retiring in six years, but uh, I'm struggling with the question of do I take out 18 months, two years, to go get some sort of credential in, in data science, which is completely different from Linux system administration, sure. kind of sort of. And my, my, my thinking is, okay, I make this investment in time and treasure, and then I've got five years to go recoup all that cost. And I'm trying to decide, is, is it really uh, worth it? And I uh, talked to some of my friends who are 20 somethings and 30 something, and they tell me, well, at age 60, you're too old to change jobs. And, uh, That's rather defeatist. It is rather, <laughs> it is rather defeatist. And, and you know, I tell them, hey, guys, you know, you're going to be 60 someday. Uh, and I'm just struggling with that question. And, and you're talking about 20 seconds of courage. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, two years of courage. Well, I have two questions for you. Yes. Do you actually expect to retire at 65? 67. 67, then? Who knows? 
no one's life, liberty, or property is safe while Congress is in session. That's fair. So I would say don't put a time limit on it, because if you're not even sure that you're going to retire, like if you're not the type that just wants the RV and like the chance to go to Mexico, then uh, why assume that that's going to be what's right for you, right? Um, so you have unlimited time. You have until you die. We all have until we die, right? So if you think of yourself on your deathbed and you're like, oh, I should, really should have taken that data science certificate, well then um, why, do, why not do something that you know you'll regret later? But my other question is, do you really need the cert? Can you just learn the skills and do it? Yeah, you, you need the cert because if you look at the, the help wanted positions, they're looking for someone who has a credential. Mm -hmm. It's often a good way to get your foot in the door. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I got a, a lot of extra degrees, though, and sometimes I question the cost of those pieces of paper. So That's where networking can come into play too. Like if a job description says that you need a certain certification or even a degree. Mm. I mean, I've had situations where I've gotten jobs that I don't meet those qualifications because I know someone internally who will vouch for my skill set. There's totally that, and there's also like with open source and stuff, especially if you can point to a project that you did that would be equivalent to the final project of the cert you're looking at, mm -hmm. you can just say, look, I didn't want to pay for the cert, but I did this thing that is more complex or just as fast or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I see two hands up, we'll start here. Um, there's also the practical problem though, for a lot of cert and degree programs are just terrible. <laughs> 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 that, I will, that will remain nameless that was not very good and I dropped out. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to roll my own program, but one thing I've been curious about is, you know, in addition to just doing your own work and posting something on GitHub, I mean, how likely is it that you're actually going to be able to work around the lack of qualifications problem? I can't put a percentage on that, but yeah, it's, it's really uh, up to the hiring manager. That is one place where using your network is a perfectly good idea. Um, at Amazon, we have a little asterisk on every job description. It says something like four-year degree or equivalent experience or, you know, networking at CCNA or, you know, relevant experience, stuff like that. So if you can show yourself to someone as having relevant experience, then you can often get by that. Yeah. Uh, some HR office goes through HR and they're just like following up the but it's just a lazy way of filtering out applicants. There was one hand over here and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just got my recent position two months ago after 15 years basically out of the workforce raising kids, homeschooling, and part-time consulting. And that was partly network, but my resume uh, caught their attention because I'm also a part-time tango instructor. And so I had technical skills plus something that was like, I've never seen this on a resume before. I like that. You know, I think there's something to that. You're totally right. Actually, my LinkedIn is like creepily up to date, but I also, when Microsoft bought LinkedIn, um, added some jobs. Jobs. Uh, one of them is like chocolate chip cookie consumer, which I did for seven years. Um, secretly, I haven't quit, but it's on there, <laughs> um, and it's appealing in the same way that perhaps being an Argentine tango instructor can be. Right? Like it sets you apart from the crowd. Right. I just tried to connect with you, and it's requiring an email address. Oh shit. So on the program, my, my name is Amy Celeste. If you just add at Gmail to that. Um, oh. So yeah, I'll put that in there for next time. Go ahead. So I, I, I can say that I, I deal with uh, the this, uh, gap that we could uh, get as technocrats. Because that's what a lot of us, what we are. We're, we're trying to be leaders within a technical field. And we have to be able to leverage the language we know into the language of the hiring parties. So when you don't have a credential, a specific credential, a specific degree or certificate, and there is the option for equivalency, make sure you include the language of that equivalency in your resume. It is not humans that are scanning these resumes. It's machines. In machine language, they're looking for key terms and phrases. So if you want to market yourself beyond that credential, you need to go ahead and have that in there. Uh, do a Google search or wherever to find what the current terminology is. Don't rely on last year's or the year before, because in, in all tech fields, they update constantly. Uh, 
remember that you're marketing yourself as a brand. Your name is your brand. You need to go ahead and show what your brand can do. To add to that, you can also just use the wording that they use in the job description and send a slightly different resume to every person that you, pain in the ass, I know, I'm sorry. But it, it can help because they see those keywords, right? And if they do use a computer to just figure out, like, do you hit 80% of these things? Oh, well, if you don't, then sh But if you're just using a synonym, eh, yeah. So go ahead and update it, right? Yeah. Um, so one thing that might help out, my last two positions, the, my previous position actually got it. If I, if I was to be qualified at all, I would not have gotten it. I basically got it because I had worked with the sysadmin that worked before he became the IT director. And then at the time, I had a job offer for another company. So I was like, no, let me reach out. Hey, I got a job offer from here. What can you do? He's like, hey, I can pay you money, no interview, and you can have this job. I was like, all right. I went down there, literally handed me a job. The company had problems, whatever. My current, <laughs> my, my current role, I, I was like, at that time, I was then looking for something else. I was like, all right, I want to work at a stable company now. I'm, not, I'm done with chaos. So then uh, I had worked with a contractor in the semiconductor industry. And we only worked together for maybe like two or three months before he left the company, and then I went my way doing something else. And then I, I was gonna congrat, uh, congratulate him on LinkedIn. I was like, hey, thanks for the, it's cool that you're working at this company now. And he's like, you need to come work here, it's awesome. I'm like, uh. <laughs> so I flew out there, talked to him, and he actually was able to like shortcut my resume through. When I put in my application on the online process, like I went through the front door and put in my thing, and he's like, hey, go get that guy's um, application. You want him. And when I sat down and talked with the interviewer, they're like, yes, we'll hire you. Okay. To the point where one of the other guys was like, hey, if you don't hire him, I will hire him. Nice. So, Excellent. So just by like knowing people, hurt. like yeah. because people, it seems like in general, if you get along with people, they, they're like, I, I want to work with him. I don't care. We'll teach him the skills. Oh. <laughs> totally. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, I did 15 years in the Navy and uh, was transitioning out. Um, I was in submarines. So that language barrier you're talking about, like that was, we go through a whole class, but it's out of touch. It's like the CERT, the CERT programs. It's mm. 10 years old at that point. Yep. Um, so. I still think of myself as in transition because I went into the government contracting, so speaking mm. that same language. Mm. I, I applied to Amazon and these other companies, um, even with all the leadership stuff and uh, the, the software skills, I keep getting passed up. I don't even get... I have a feeling that I might know why, because I actually used to work with, uh, I would volunteer with ex-military people and help them brush up their skills and stuff. Um, and a lot of times I'd get a resume from a guy that was really smart and who I knew I got along with and I would look at it and it was just gibberish to me. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of stuff on like Medium and in lynda.com uh, and stuff that helps you with like really basic career skills like making a tech resume and stuff like that. Um, I would totally recommend brushing up on that. Uh, but also this is another place where using your network is great. Like I know Amazon has a ton of like warriors stuff which is ex-military. Um, so applying for a job that's t tagged as ex-military, like even at other large companies they do that. Some small companies are entirely run by people who used to be in the military and speak that language. Okay. Um, you kind of have a niche thing, right? Like not everyone's ex-military, so you need to target a little better. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you still have your security clearance? Yep, and that's why I was a shoe in into the, the contracting world. But yeah, that's because what you're looking for if you're ex if you're former military and you still have security clearance too, you might want to look into like cybersecurity jobs, like like SOC, entry level SOC jobs and stuff. I mean, you get a security plus, uh, combine that with military background plus security clearance. Yeah, I've got. Uh, you may be looking at like the like POD. I guess I would say I would have to say I definitely am already in that, uh, but I have an excellent job. I'm just in the category of your like, I mean, all our stuff. As soon as you have the clearance. I'm in a, a hole, no windows, and it's terrible and dark. Oh, yeah, like it. <laughs> like I want to have the, uh, at least once in my career in life, have the place where my dog can go to the bathroom there. Like, it's a totally different world. Totally. Uh, so, so Amazon has got that. Amazon has got a juicy contract with the United States government, and they've got a data center somewhere in the western United States that they're, and they're looking for people with clearances and they want people who've got clearances that can start right now. Last well, they had the there was how they were um, recruiting for a position that required clearance. So I'm not surprised. I have to work with some of those cleared people for the parts of my job. Um, and uh, I know, number one, it is hard to find enough U.S. citizens to fill the hole. Uh, and I know that sounds horrible, but if you're going to work for the government, you kind of need <laughs> that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I highly recommend maybe talking after and I'll, I'll tell you some of the stuff to look for online. So, 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you ever ask people, like, when you're looking for a new job, what sucks about the position? They always lie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, if they're very good salespeople, they will get you like inspired and fired up about their particular job first, and then they'll tell you what's shitty about it. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people just will avoid that question. Um, so I ask actually different questions. I don't ask them what sucks about it, because also they might hate like a high ticket load, but like I like the excitement of Sev2. So um, you know, it may just be different. They might think differently than you. So I start to ask things about like, uh, you know, what kind of work do you do day to day? How many escalations do you deal with? What kind of projects do you have going right now? How much of your software is legacy code? Um, <laughs> what process is your favorite process at work? And what is like the one that is most frustrating to you and why? Um, and that gives me a sense of like, instead of they're like, oh, everything is roses. That like gives me a chance to see, oh, these are all blue roses, but I really like red roses. So maybe this still isn't the right job for me, right? So you're basically just, Asking what things would be deal breakers for you, not the absolute of what But I don't tell them they're deal breakers for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <Yeah. laughs> totally. Um, I see another hand. One, uh, just to speak to that one thing that I've found, well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, if you're interviewing in an office, um, you, know, you can pick up a lot just from like body language and general demeanor mm -hmm. from other mm -hmm. people there without even talking to them. As far as questions in the interview, one sort of generic question that I like to ask that I think you can sometimes get a lot of good information from is um, what is, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing about the workplace, what would it be? And I think that is a really interesting question because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily even speak to like tech, right? Because they might answer with something technical, they might answer with something culture related, uh, but it can give you some really interesting insight into um, what kind of culture you might be stepping into. And I have turned, to, you know, I have declined to continue job interview processes because of bad answers to those questions. What do you consider to be a bad answer to the culture question? Um, I mean, so <laughs> the worst answer is if they say um, that they wouldn't change anything. I think that's a major tell. Like, nothing is perfect, right? Like, it's I also really such like, a non-answer. I really like the company that I work for right now, but like, if you ask me things to change, like, I could give you a, a list of things to change. And I love my job. I love my company. Um, but like, so I think that's the key thing that I'm looking for is like I'm looking for an innate honesty there. Like are they are they comfortable even answering the question, first of all? Because if they're not, then it may just be them personally, but if it is the culture that's making them not feel comfortable to answer that question, I wouldn't work for wouldn't work for a company where people aren't able to talk about the shortcomings openly. That makes sense. Also it sort of gives you an idea though about like Again, the blue roses versus the red roses, right? Like, if it's a company that likes to go out every Friday and eat pizza and drink, like, that's awesome for maybe about a year for me, and then I get tired of going out every Friday with work people, no matter how much I love them. Um, but that's how I got fat, too. That's like a sneaker. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> I love it. Hand over here. The one thing I do to help get a job is I send, I send the, the list of my questions before me. Mm. So that is a good tactic. I have like five standard questions, and if they don't even bother to answer them, I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What What are your five standard questions? So I always ask for what the average turnover rate is, like the length of time, because um, that gives you kind of like a ballpoint uh, or ballpark figure. You never um, would have worked at Amazon then. I, <laughs> I, I, I got a job offer, but at the time, there was that uh, Desk Crier article that came out. Oh, yeah, like 2015. They, totally. they were aren't honest with me. It was 13 months at the time. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was horrible for a while. Yeah. I'm like the in the top like five nines of employees there now, and I've only been there for eight and a half years, so something like that. that you would at that time you would really be on like the the, the guy I was uh, who would have been my boss. He had been there for four years, and everyone was joking that he had been like he was like the ancient the ancient guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, a secret about that article, though, is I think they interviewed something like 20-ish people. I tried to count the names. I got bored. But of the long sections that were really horrific, only one of them wasn't on the team that I used to be on. So it was a very biased article because there was a reason I left that team, right? Um, so, so this really question, yeah. team not, 
What? It was totally the team and not the company, but yeah. no one who reads the article knows that. And <laughs> it pisses me off to no end because I still to this day get questions. Is it really like in the article? Are you crying at your desk? Um, you take your laptop into the bathroom? <laughs> My, my director does, and I think it's so gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a germaphobe, so yeah, that's right. disgusting. Hopefully he uses hand sanitizer. One, you know one, one of the questions that uh, I ask at, at interviews is, is what are your pain points? What, what keeps you awake at night? And there have been several times when the manager has, has given me an answer. And so then my next question is, that has nothing to do with the job description. Why is that? <laughs> and, a couple of managers have said, you know, you're right. It does have nothing to do with the job description. So when you say the job description is frequently sucked, you are absolutely right on it. I mean, it's true. You can ask like what your day to day is. And I think that gives you a little bit more of, of you know, if, if you're talking to someone you know is going to be a peer of yours, asking what their day to day is like will give you more information than the job description. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking to like the person who will be your boss, that tells you nothing, right? So, yeah. Well, one of the things I've been struggling with is um, I am looking to get into the work world in a career changing way, and I'm having trouble getting from the paper to the person. I know mm -hmm. what my skills are, and I know when I look at the companies, I would be so valuable to them mm -hmm. if I could just talk to them. So, totally. How do you get from the stack of papers to, oh, we'd like to talk to you? Because that seems to be the missing piece for me. So, you have like a short list of companies you like. Right? Or I'm just finding that each time I'm looking through different positions and things and I and I, I read about the company and I, I try and look at my research and I realize, wow, I would have a lot of things to contribute to this organization if mm -hmm. I could be able to talk to them. Totally. But when they look at my resume and they see, Oh, you were out of the work home for a while, you were raising children but there's there's things that make me get I think kind of round filed before I even have opportunity to a lot of tech companies have things that are targeted towards returning mothers um, lately because that's a place where we lose a lot of people out of the pipeline and they never come back. Um, so in some cases, it might be worth it to look at larger tech companies um, because you know we acknowledge that the pipeline is hard to fill. Um, you have the relevant skills for the job you're looking at. Cool. Um, I would also go to things like Linux Fest and go talk to people at tables and you know meetups for things that are related to the skills that you know you have and start trying to develop a network and use it because a lot of times, especially this works better with smaller companies, if you know someone, it's easier to get your foot in the door. Um, with Amazon, even people that I try to like coach through, like sometimes they also can't do it. It's, it's challenging, like I tried to work for Google uh, I did not make it through the interview. It was the worst experience I've ever had. Um, but I would have been a perfectly good employee there too and I could have seen myself there, right? Um, with you though, I think it might take a little bit more patience and persistence and it'll be frustrating. So, like I hear you, I, I don't have a lot of good advice for that one. So, hopefully that helps though. I think um, one thing that I've read on like IT career advice forums too for people just starting out that may not have career experience in the field that they're trying to work in would be to um, you know, do anything in that's related just as a personal project. Like if you're wanting to do web development, you know, like register a domain and install WordPress and like just, you know, play like play around with it. If you want to be a sysadmin, set up a home lab. Like there, you know, if, if you want to learn or, or like if you already know how to program and you're trying to get a job as a developer, like find, you know, there's like Bellingham codes if you live here in town or wherever you live, there's probably some kind of group there, um, and if there's not one locally where you live, there are hundreds, thousands of them online, you know, where you can find people to share in that in that journey, or like that are also interested in that. And so there, I, I think that that's one strength that we have living in this era is that we can easily connect with other people. Totally, those are some great ideas. Hopefully, those helped you too. Yes. Awesome. And list it on your resume, by the way. Don't just talk about it in the interview. Right, because if you're having problems getting to that interview point, like you want to, you know, make sure to list it on your resume, even if it is just like, you know, install WordPress and set up, you know, whatever .org domain, so they they know that you're doing something. That's actually a good point. Um, volunteering a lot. Uh, I know people who like volunteer at schools, and schools have IT problems. So right, that's what I had, had been doing for the, the full time period that I was. Parenting. I was well, then you have years of volunteer back. experience. 
put that on your resume and just don't call a volunteer. If you're in Bellingham, <laughs> Bellingham Makerspace would love more volunteers. <laughs> you're like, no, I want to get paid, but. <laughs> and I guess I would say, too, I'll contribute back to the group. So the company I work at, um, we have one guy, he, he was doing a job fair with me. And uh, every resume he was throwing into a pile. And I was, I was like, why? These guys seem legit. Like, why are you throwing them? Oh, their GPA is not good enough. So immediately threw them out. <laughs> I was like, yeah, completely separate. We weren't, we weren't talking before that. What personal projects have you done? What, you know, show me. And the, the one guy I wanted, every company wanted. Why? He had two things on there. He did his uh, local club's website, and he maintained it. Mm -hmm. And then he did something for an animal shelter. But that's, you know, it's not just a piece of paper. He, he's done work, and I can see it. So. Totally. But you might find those guys who just say it's not a good, it's a joke now in our thing. If your GPA is not good enough, don't go to Tom. But uh, I wouldn't get hired. Yeah, you're not. I wouldn't. In uh, how much talent was just gone because you couldn't see it. But you wouldn't want to work for him. Yeah, so, I mean that's actually a really good leading indicator. Like if you know that he cares about his GPA, <laughs> like that's not relevant to you. It's a good sign. It's yeah. good information. Don't work there. It's also a good lesson not to right. list your GPA on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depends on the company. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. 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 That's funny. My dad got a four, but he went to one of the few schools that has a six point GPA, but he never told me. <laughs> 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 so. uh, that's funny. Fantastic. Cool. I don't see any more hands up, so thank you all for coming. It was really nice chatting with you. Mm -hmm.